Hello, and welcome back to the Paper Soprano podcast. I am your host, and my name is Heidi. <laughs> oh my god, sorry. I thought I had to sneeze. <laughs> well, maybe it was just a cough. Woo, that was crazy. <laughs> okay, well, I should probably just end the podcast there, because, um... That's as exciting as we're probably going to (laughs) get. Oh, man. But no, I actually... Speaking of exciting, I've got some things growing on my windowsill. Like plants, not like, I don't know, bacteria. But like, I've got these little plants growing on my windowsill right now. And they are living for this sunlight. Like these past couple days have been super sunny and I have some microgreens growing. We've got some scallions growing. We've got some pothos. I've got a bamboo plant. We've got some um, spider plants all over the place. You've got some ivy, some other weird random things. And like, they're just, oh, oh my God. So sorry. Just literally slapped the microphone. Um, I would cut that out for you to like pr- protect your ears, but also... I'm not going to. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just not going to. Um, so anyway, yeah. That's kind of, that's what's been going on. Today we had to go into work, even though it is Saturday. Because everything is horrible. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It's move-in weekend for the campus. So that means... I have to be at the building that I manage, and that's fine, you know, whatever. have to be there again tomorrow, so it's like, this is going to be, like, a perpetual weekend into a new work week, which is also the start of the semester. Love that for me. I don't know why on earth. Why does, why don't schools, I, here's my question. Why don't schools, like, encourage their students and staff and everybody to just like have like a reverse finals week at the beginning of the semester like you come back to school and technically like you're supposed to be there like whatever you know like not orientation not anything like that you just have like a week of where you're supposed to be back at school everybody's like communicating and setting things up and like getting things moving, but no classes are allowed to be held, no assignments, no syllabuses, no nothing. It's just like a week of communication and like setting things up. Because this whole like, let's cram it into one weekend and then start on Monday thing. What is up with that? How rude. Like, don't you know that we have anxiety? Like, (laughs) that people up in here like be having anxiety left and right in the collegiate setting and also like we need time I don't know maybe that would that would be very helpful to a um to the student body I think it would and it would be kind of like reading week or finals week where you're not allowed to have classes but like you're still on campus you're still doing whatever but you're just kind of like prepping you're you're studying you're getting yourself set maybe you actually have time to print out the syllabus maybe you actually get your planner in order you know maybe you get yourself a couple folders a couple binders here and there get your textbooks you get your things going and you don't have to literally like crap your pants every day of like the first two weeks of school because Everything's all happening all at once, but I think that would be ideal. I just know that that's not how the world works, unfortunately. But who says? Who says that that's not how the world could work? I know that's not how it currently works, but why not, like, why do people always just shut down, like, hypothetical conversations like this? I think these kinds of conversations are the ones that, like, spur progress I don't know let's have more of them anyway speaking of hypothetical conversations um I was watching a video last night that I encourage you all to watch it is Curtis Connors recent most recent post 
Curtis Connor is a comedian and a YouTuber, and he creates a lot of really unique content, I feel like. And usually it's all like kind of comedy based and, you know, it's just for fun. But this video specifically struck me as something that's a little bit more chat worthy. I don't know. Like it was kind of intense. And the whole concept was he kind of questioned the whole idea of AI. You know how you've seen those memes of like, I forced a bot to watch like 65,000 hours of The Office and it wrote an episode for me. And it's like, okay, well, he kind of debunks that whole meme and is like, listen, there aren't that many hours of this thing or whatever. And this like, it wouldn't come out this coherent and blah, blah, blah. Like he talks to a guy who... I think the guy worked with AI or he's like familiar with the whole process and um, like of training AI and having them create things. And like, it's just really interesting to me how Curtis like frames the entire video. It's like, it's, he kind of presents scenarios in a funny way, like in the beginning of the video, obviously. But then at the end of the video, he's like, okay, so now I wanted <laughs> to test it. And he basically, like, pays for a couple of his videos to be transcribed and written, like, the whole screenplay written, not just, like, the subtitles, but, like, the whole, like, action and characters and whatever. Whatever he's doing in his videos, he pays for, like, a screenwriting company to like dictate all of them and then he like forces an AI bot to watch it and then the AI bot like basically writes an episode for him so it's kind of an interesting premise like the AI bot is like creating for a creator based on their creations and it's one of the main things that he kind of said within the video was like, this is really uncomfortable. Like in a way, you know, for some reason, this makes you uncomfortable. Like knowing that this, this robot created this thing, it's a little bit weird, right? And it's a little bit unsettling. Like, yeah, it's funny. Ha ha ha. But like, there's something off about it. <laughs> like there's something not right. And um, he also asked this really big question is artificial intelligence art, like art created by artificial intelligence, is that still art? Or is it like art is an innately human thing? Like he posted or he included some p photos of a painting, I guess, that like an AI created or simulated or whatever with like it looked at thousands or so of you know, paintings of faces or whatever, and it created a painting. And it looks really weird. Like, it doesn't really look good. Like, if you watch the video, you can tell that there's definitely some weird, weird things going on. But is that art? Like, that's a serious question, like, that I think people should be discussing. Like, is auto-generated art, is that art? Like, I don't know. Would you consider some of, like, the auto-generated, like, loops for music? Like, beats or, or, um, I don't know. Because those are all, those are all created by someone, though, right? You have to, I don't think artificial intelligence creates, like, tracks on GarageBand that you can use. I don't, I'm not sure. I'm not positive. But I'm pretty sure that's not the case. But if it is, like, is GarageBand, like, is that considered art? Because, like, there is a human element, like, we are putting it together, but, like, the pieces themselves, were they created by artificial intelligence? I don't really know. I'm leaning towards no. But it's just, it's such an interesting concept to me. It's so strange to think about, like, AI replacing jobs and replacing, um you know, manual labor and things like that. But also, who's to say? Who's to say when when AI is going to start taking over 
art. Like, are we going to draw the line somewhere? Like, as humans, do we just get too weirded out? Like, are we going to accept it after some time? I don't know, man. I don't know. (laughs) I think there's a pretty good chance that we probably will. Because people have Alexas, like, literally next to their beds. And people have Siri's. And people have... You know, people are all concerned about the government listening into my phone conversations. But, like, dude, it, you cannot be surprised. Like, you have a supercomputer in your hand right now. Good lord. Um, so, yeah, it's just a very interesting concept that perhaps at some point in the future, um, art could potentially be artificially created. I think that... For me personally, I feel like a lot of the times the the details in which I, I know are imperfect are some of the most awe-inspiring things that I hear or see in terms of art. Like, not necessarily mistakes, but those moments in which I know it's all happening like literally as time is being as time is progressing like in that literal present moment i think it would be super hard for an ai bot to like think so critically i don't know maybe i'm just underestimating artificial intelligence (laughs) but i don't know this is a good conversation to have there's a lot of questions being asked which is the mark of a a good question is when you have more questions after you ask it. You know, that's a that's a good question. You should talk about that. All right, people. Let's take our vitamins, shall we? Let's go ahead. Let's jump right in. Take our vitamins. Yesterday, who did we have? We're doing our minute sketch. Oh, yesterday we had our boy, Joseph Hyden. Franz Joseph Hyden. Papa Hyden, if you will. And today we have, why do I not, oh my god, why do I not recognize this name? Okay, so the name is Luigi Bocciarini, 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 I'm probably saying that incorrectly. But his subtitle, like how Haydn was Papa Haydn, this guy, Luigi Bocciarini's subtitle is Nicknamed, quote, the wife of Haydn, end quote. <laughs> Come on, our girls, our, our, our authors of this book are just dragging all of these people. Oh, Eva and Helen, Eva and Helen are the authors of this book. Minute sketches of great composers. Look it up. It's a good read. Okay. <laughs> Born 1743, died 1805. A perpetual fountain of music with a stopcock to be turned on or off as desired. Gonna have to look that up. So sorry. If you do know what a stopcock is, I have no idea. (laughs) That is the description given of Luigi Bocciarini. Called the wife of Haydn because his chamber music so closely resembled that contemporaries. He has his own particular claim to fame. Nevertheless, he brought the cello part the cello being his own instrument, into a prominent place in the string quartet where Haydn had always regulated it to the humble task of accompanying the first violin, of course. Um, As he wrote under patronage with the assurance of immediate performance, his output was enormous. He was born in Lucca, Italy, February 19th, 1743, and his father, a contrabass player, was his first teacher, but a teacher with significant sufficient wisdom to pack the boy off to Rome to study violin, cello, and composition with Abbe Venucci Venucci, as soon as he recognized his unusual talent. Luigi's friendship with the violinist Manfredi in Rome ripened into an artistic partnership, and together they started concertizing, arriving finally at the court of Charles IV in Madrid. Excuse me. Oh my god, we've got indigestion! Okay. Here they received such a warm Spanish welcome that they remained. 
Boccherini, with a fat annuity and the added honor of being court favorite, found himself with nothing to do in return except for to turn to to turn out trios, quartets, quintets, violin or cello pieces, and occasional symphonies or operas, which he did with consummate ease. All went well until the fatal day when the king objected to a certain passage in a new trio as being hackneyed. Boccherini agreed to correct it, but impudently doubled its repetition instead. <gasps> Whereupon the king, infuriated at the implied slur on his musicality, forthwith dismissed him in disgrace. Oh, <laughs> another patron was found, the French consul Lucien Bonaparte, for whose musical for whose musicals Boccherini's fountain of inspiration played merrily. But Bonaparte was recalled, and Luigi fell upon evil days. The story of his last years is a sad record of illness and poverty. He was reduced to making guitar arrangements for wealthy amateurs and selling his compositions for practically nothing at all. His death on May 28th, 1805, was a release from misery. Oh, that's horrible. In his voluminous output, 125 string quintets, 91 string quartets, 54 string trios, 20 symphonies, and cello and violin pieces, flowing, original melody, and harpsichordian delicacy, and refinement are always present. No wonder the court ladies pointed their little toes with such stately zest to the strains of the famous Boccherini Minuet. I hope I'm saying that last name right. Jesus Christ. <laughs> which wafts to us today the perfume of their dainty presence. Dang! Okay, well, first of all, um, we need to address this. I have no idea what a stopcock is. What is a stopcock? Okay, it's a noun. It's an internally... Or an externally operated valve regu regulating the flow of a liquid or gas through a pipe. So. Oh, okay. So it's just like a. So it's just a faucet. Your stopcock is the control tap for your mains water. If you supply leaks. Okay, blah, blah, blah. What the heck, dude? I have never heard that word before in my life. God, you really do learn something every day. I'm like kind of upset about this. Why am I angry that I didn't know what that was? Um, anyway, LOL also at the whole like uh, reduced to making guitar arrangements bit. I'm sure if I'm sure a lot of my um, string player friends who may or may not be listening to this know of this composer. Although, what is up with that nickname, The Wife of Haydn? Seems a little shady to me right now. Not necessarily sure about the whole etymology of that nickname. But, yeah, dude. Interesting. Interesting. Never, ever have I come across that composer in my life. And also, some of the terminology used in this book, clearly. So, yeah, guys, you learn something every single day. <laughs> we love that for me. All right, I am going to go to the store because I need some things from there. Then I'm going to come back here and I'm going to spend my Saturday night getting ready for work tomorrow on Sunday morning. <laughs> All right, if you liked this podcast and you would like to hear more of it, you're going to have to subscribe, okay? That's just how it works. So go ahead, subscribe. And I post literally a new podcast every single day. The length is varied. The time at which I post is varied. So it's, it's a surprise. You can also like this video. You can comment down below. Let me know you're listening. And yeah, I hope you have a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening, or night whenever you happen to be listening to this podcast. This podcast, of course is the Paper Soprano podcast, and I, of course, am your host, and my name is Heidi, <laughs> and I hope everything goes your way today, people. 
the goal of your life. Go out, go forth and prosper. <laughs> oh God, I'm such an idiot. I have no idea what I'm saying. Okay. Love you. Mean it. Bye. <laughs>